Hello, welcome to Jason the Old Millennial. My name is Jason. I'm speaking to you here in my basement in the great state of Kansas. And in this episode, I'm going to uh, continue um, talking about my top 100 favorite albums. I'm going to go over two, uh, two albums on my list. I'm down to number 86 and number 85 on my list. Um, so I'm going to do a little review of those two albums, why I like them so much. Um, and just thank you for subscribing and uh, watching my video, and I appreciate it. Um, so the first uh, album I'm going to talk about, number 86 on my list, is Chicago Transit Authority by the band Chicago. It came out in 1969. It's their first studio album, uh, and they made tons of studio albums. Uh, they have quite a big list. Um, and there's 12 songs on here. Three really well-known songs that I knew coming in to listen to this album. Uh, Does anybody really know what time it is? Uh, beginnings and Question 67 and 68. If you don't know much about Chicago, those are probably the three songs you've probably heard before on the radio. Uh, I've heard those quite uh, got a lot of airplay. Um, it's a album that has a lot of instrumentals. Uh, there's lots of songs that are just mostly guitar or uh, other instruments. Um, so not all of them are like your usual rock songs with lots of um, singing. And then I prefer the songs that are singing, of course, where you hear the people singing more than just instrumentals, personally. Um, like, so those three real good. Um, Listen and Someday, other two other songs on here are pretty good, I think, on here. Not as well known, but I think are very well done. Uh, Chicago has uh, quite a large number in their group because they have not only have a kind of a rock, usual kind of rock band, they're kind of I, looking them up they're described as a jazz rock band. I thought it maybe more as a blues rock band, but they say jazz. Uh, mostly because they have they have the usual rock band uh, and people like uh, you know guitar and keyboards and drums uh, and bass, but then they also add um, trombone, saxophone, and trumpet to their uh, to their sound. So it makes them a very unique sound um, with a really good you know really heavy rock sound mixtured with, uh, I guess the jazz part is probably the instruments that they play, the horns and woodwinds. Um, so very interesting sound. I don't think I've heard anybody really with the unique sound of this band, Chicago, which I really enjoy how different they sound. Um, you got three really major um, singers and songwriters in the band, um, and that is Terry Kath as the lead guitar player really great guitar play. The guitar solos are really amazing on this album. Um, and look them up, look their, uh, look up their um, live on YouTube, look up like live concerts that they do. Uh, really fun to watch him play. Um, but he also has a great singing voice uh, and he writes a couple songs on this album. So he can do it all. Very good. Um, then Robert Lamb, uh, he plays the keyboards and he also really good singer. Uh, he's the major, the biggest singer on this album and songwriter. Uh, he uh, co-wrote six of the he wrote or co-wrote six of the twelve songs on here. So he definitely is the most prolific of the songwriters on here, and lead sings uh, most of the songs. Uh, very good um, overall. Um, and Peter Cetera, uh, which is actually the name I knew the most out of all three of them. Because I know he had a solo career in the 80s, and I know some of his music that he did in the 80s um, as well. Uh, really great voice. Maybe the best voice out of the three. I absolutely love his voice. But he plays the bass, and um, like I said, he didn't write any songs on this album, but he, he writes songs on other Chicago albums. So he can be a songwriter, though he didn't write any on here. And he leads a couple times, um, not as much as Lamb, but uh, very good. Um, all three are very excellent singers. And uh, musicians, I mean, uh, really make this band. Um, also, Danny Seraphine, Seraphine or Seraphine uh, is the drummer. Uh, very good drums. Overall, really good rock band. Uh, then you have the three horn players or woodwind players, um, and I'm not gonna get these names probably right. Um, Walter Parazader, the saxophone. Uh, Lee Lugane, Lugnane, uh does trumpet and James Pankow does trombone. So it's very interesting that trombone, saxophone, trumpet sound mixed in, and they're very good. Their instrumentation is very, very good. Uh, I really like um, all the instruments played here. Um, 
So overall, the um, album charted number 17 in the U.S., number 9 in the U.K., so top 10 in the U.K., and also number 10 in Canada, so top 10 in Canada as well. Um, probably the most well-known album, maybe. Uh, maybe one of the biggest uh, selling albums, for sure. Um, Chicago is such an interesting group. Um, when I think of Chicago, actually, I think more of their 80s music, which is much more pop rock. I think sound a lot more ballads, love ballads, and actually really enjoy their 80s music. Um, so listening to this, I didn't realize how much of a rock band they were until I was listening to this album, and I realized they have a really great rock sound, and I would put them up there with some of the great rock music um, bands is like The Who, Led Zeppelin, The Eagles. I think it was bands where the all the musician, the music is just amazingly done um, throughout. Everybody on the on the band does a really amazing job. Uh, with whatever instrument they're um, playing, um, not to mention the vocals are very good and all that. Um, so yeah, listening to the early stuff, I guess I didn't realize the early they're a bunch of different band in their early in the seventies than they were in the eighties. And so in this early period, this is the first studio album. Uh, they're much more of a rock band, I feel like, than maybe in the eighties. They're more of a pop route, but I think there's some. I haven't looked at the history of Chicago, but I understand there were some changes in the band and the group. Different members leave, uh, have come and gone in the group. So it's like almost a different group in itself, but it's all Chicago. Anyways, uh, like I said, there's three big singles on here. Uh, question 67, 68 went number 71 on the charts. Uh, does anybody really know what time it is? Went number seven. And Beginnings also went number seven in the single. So those two were top ten singles, which, yeah, it does definitely makes sense. Um, very big hits out of theirs. Um, certified two times platinum in the U.S. and platinum in Canada. So it did very well. Um, pretty good opening debut album, I would say. One of the great debut albums I've had on my list. I've had a couple so far. Um, there's some more coming up. Uh, it got nominated for a Grammy for Best New Artist. I'm not sure who won that year, but I'm surprised they didn't win. They a pretty good uh, artists. I mean, to begin a great album to begin with, really split, planted themselves as a, one of the great rock bands. And this is 1969, so uh, right at the end of the 60s, I'm getting into the 70s here. Um, a little trivia that I looked up on here. One of the interesting things, uh, it broke the record for the rock album with the longest longevity, um, being on the charts for 107, 171 weeks. Uh, which is quite a long time. Pretty amazing. I had no idea it was that, you know, did that well. Um, and it stayed on the charts for, a I mean, that record stayed for a long time. I don't think it was breaking until like the 90s. And I forget what song broke it or what album broke that record. But so it was a record that it kept for quite a while. So pretty well done there. Um, the other interesting thing I, I didn't know about Chicago is the original name was Chicago Transit Authority. That was the original name of the band, um, which of course, is the name of this album, the first album. Uh, they had to change it because, of course, there's a uh, Chicago Transit Authority is the, you know, name of the government group, whatever in Ch in Chicago that, you know, takes play uh, is in charge of the transportation in that city, and they were suing Chicago for the name for copying their name, Chicago Transit Authority, which I don't know why you want to sue a band just because they have the name of your agency or whatever. It doesn't make much sense, but they were going to sue them, so they changed the name from Chicago Transit Authority to just Chicago, simply, uh, which is probably a good name change. Pretty simple to remember. Um, so, but yeah, so I thought that was interesting. But yeah, overall, really good album if you like rock and a uh, little bluesy, jazzy. I'm not a blues or a jazz fan, but if you mix it in with some good rock music, it can be very well done. And yeah, it's just a really great band, um, one of my favorites. Um, so I go to my top three, and there's no surprise that uh, my top three is the three hit singles on here. Number three, I'm going with Question 67 and 68. Number two, I'm going with Beginnings. And number one, I'm going with Does Anybody Really Know What Time It Is? One of my all-time favorite Chicago songs. Um, definitely top five, top ten for sure, if I have to look at it. Um, I love the beginning. It has one of the greatest intros, I think, in a song. Well, you start, I mean, it starts with a weird piano intro <clears throat> that doesn't seem to really fit. And then after it does a little kind of weird piano intro, uh, then the horns come in, and the horns are so, sound so good at the beginning of the song. 
uh, and really drives the tempo of the song. And then the piano comes back in, and there's a great piano part along with the trump, along with the horns. And then it seems like after all, a pretty long intro, and then all of a sudden we start setting into the actual melody of the song, and the drums and the guitar come in, all the instruments come in, and it sounds really great. And then we start with the lyrics, uh, with the vocals and uh, great vocal work. I uh, love the background. One of the things I love, not only the vocals are really good, uh, lead vocals, but I love the backing vocals because everybody can sing so well that a lot of times you have the, the people that aren't the lead singers singing back up and harmonizing and they sound so great. And I love on this song, especially when he's singing about, you know, does anybody know what time it is? And the background, they're singing, you know, uh, different lyrics. So there's, you know, lead lyrics and then there's the background lyrics. And so you have two different lyrics happening or vocals happening at the same time and they mesh in so well together. I just love the way they do that. You know, so yeah, great song. Uh, definitely one to check out if you like Chicago. Uh, so Chicago Transit Authority, number 86 on my list. And so the other album we talk about is number 85 on my list. Uh, much different album, uh, much different artists. And this uh, is Straight Out of Linwood by Weird Al Yankovic. Uh, which came out in 2006 and it is his 12th studio album. So it's obviously been later um, in his career. He's had such a long, successful career um, starting back in the 80s, I believe. Um, he's just the master of what he does, which is parody songs and comedy songs. Um, parody songs as far as just taking an actual song and just changing the lyrics to fit you know, a different uh, idea. Uh, or similar idea, but making a comedy aspect to it. Um, but he also has some original songs that parody styles of music, I guess. Not doesn't or doesn't exactly parody one song, but maybe parodies a band or a genre, um, and kind of writes a song in that genre or band type. And he does very well with that. Um, I'm a huge Weird Al Yankovic fan. Been since I was a kid. I've always um, bought all bought a lot of the CDs as a kid. Uh, starting with um, uh, Bad Hair Day, uh, Running With Scissors, uh, were some of the early ones that I bought as a kid and loved those albums. Um, and every, every time he comes out with an album, I always I have to go get it and listen to it because I love to hear what he has next to write, you know. Uh, just so funny. Um, just a really funny writer. Um, but also, as I've gotten older, I've enjoyed the fact that his musicianship is so good, too. And the way he records his music and how he has his studio work with so many different sounds. He also does such a great job of, re, you know, not only does he sing lead, um, but he also does the, his own backing vocals a lot of times. So you hear his voice very uh, different times in a, in a song either. So it sounds like a whole band that's just him singing, but he just recorded his leads and his backings and his different harmonies. So he's harmonizing with himself. So it's just amazing work, I think, in studio and different sound effects and all that that he does and just the way that he's able to um, adapt to different genres of music is pretty amazing and he does such a good job that he can do a rap song to a pop song to a rock song to a uh, folk song uh, anything he adapts to it very well not maybe the greatest singer but I mean good enough that he can um, sound kind of similar to what he's parodying which is pretty good um, this song, um, this album has probably as big, it does have his biggest hit of his career, uh, White and Nerdy. Huge, huge song. Was all over YouTube, one of the funniest uh, videos, and was on the radio quite a bit. You don't hear a lot of Weird Al songs on the radio, of course, because he has such a different uh, type of music, because he's a comedy writer, kind of, and I don't know if people take him, not everybody probably takes him seriously, but, um, but every once in a while he gets one that everybody loves, like White and Nerdy, that really resonates with uh, everybody. Um, besides that, yeah, there's, yeah, that's the one you probably know the most. But there's a lot of good songs on here. Um, like I said, White and Nerdy uh, hit number nine on the U.S. charts. Uh, it's the highest uh, charting for Yankovic in his career, which he's had this really long, successful career. Lots of Grammys, uh, made lots of money. And the, uh, White and Nerdy is his biggest single which makes sense. Uh, it definitely, like I said, resonated. Very funny um, song, uh, especially like me, who is a white person, 
who was somewhat nerdy in themselves, you know, it really speaks to me in that way. And I think I probably spoke to a lot of people that were felt themselves white and nerdy. And maybe, I don't know, that's my guess. But yeah, it's such a great song. Uh, Canadian Idiot, another song on here, which is, of course, a parody of American Idiot by Green Day, uh, was a single that hit number 82 on the charts. Um, not one of my favorite songs on the album, actually, but I can kind of get American Idiot was a hit song for Green Day. So I kind of get why, you know, maybe they try to make a single, but yeah, definitely White Nerdy is definitely the, I guess I'll talk about in my top three, definitely the highlight of this uh, album. Uh, the album charted number 10 in the U.S. overall, so a pretty good top 10 charting. Uh, like I said, he has so many albums, yeah, it's interesting that he, this is one of the last albums that he's made, I think. Um, and he's still, in his, I don't know if he's getting up to the 60s by now. But even as getting older, he's still making such great music. I mean, as far as parodying music, his own genre. I mean, I don't know of anybody else that can do his kind of music as well as he can. I mean, he's just the king of parody music. And he's always be known as the king of parody music. Um, of course, a certified U.S. gold. Um, he was nominated for a Grammy for Best Comedy Album. Didn't win, but he's won so many comedy album Grammys. So uh, you almost feel like he has to win every single one because I don't know anybody else that can compete with him as a comedy writer or musician and all that. So I don't know who beat him out. It might have been uh, a stand-up comedian or something like that. But as far as what he does, nobody does it better. Um, lots of interesting trivia as I was looking up this album. Um, one of the biggest ones was he when, when he first was going to come out with this album, he wrote a song called You're Pitiful which was parodying a James Blunt song, You're Beautiful, which was one of James Blunt's biggest hit, or it was his biggest hit. Um, and so he wrote the song, um, You're Pitiful, and it was going to be on this album. It, it's not on the album. Uh, it's not on any albums. It was going to be his lead song. So White Nerdy, You're Pitiful, was going to be the, was suspected to be the hit song on the album, the first single coming out on this album. Uh, but he did You're Pitiful, and of course he always asked permission by the uh, musician who wrote it. You know, he likes to get permission before he puts it on an album, even though he doesn't need to. He doesn't want to put it on an album unless he gets permission. So he went to get permission from James Blunt. James Blunt was fine with him doing this uh, parody song, but James Blunt's um, record company, Atlantic Records, uh, blocked it, said they did not want him to uh, use you're pitiful on an album uh, which is very odd because the musician said yes usually you think the record company would be okay with it why would they go against their own client but they decided no that they thought that it would um, hurt James Blunt's uh, career and make it look like James Blunt only is a one-hit wonder that the only song he ever has is you're beautiful so they're afraid of him being parodied so early in his career that it might I don't know why, it doesn't make much sense, but you know, that's what happens when you get a company, get involved, suits try to make, uh, you know, they always make decisions that aren't the best decisions based on what they think will be best, you know, for record sales. But, you know, I think it was a very bad idea not having, there's nothing wrong with um, Weird Al Yankovic parodying you. In fact, it probably helps you more than anything. Uh, it's almost a big compliment being parodied by um, Weird Al because he's such a huge artist in himself. Um, so it's very unfortunate that Your Pitiful doesn't appear on this album because it's a really great song. In fact, uh, um, because he couldn't get it on the album, Weird Al, and I remember this at the time when it happened back in 2006, um, uh, he put it on the internet for free that you can download it for free. So, of course, I went and downloaded it for free when uh, he did this. And great song, very funny, very well done parody. Would have been a really good song on this album. Um, of course, he put it out because James Blunt was okay with it. It was just a record company that wasn't okay with it. So he was fine with putting it out as a free single. Um, and he does it. At, I've seen Weird Al in concert, actually. I saw him in concert not long after this album, I think. Um, probably around 2008 or 2009 I saw him in concert and he of course did a lot of the music on this album and but he did do uh, You're Pitiful was the song he did in concert and it's very funny because he um, has a bunch of t-shirts on and he takes one t-shirt off 
and there's a different t-shirt underneath kind of parodying the James Blunt music video and one of the t-shirts that he has maybe the last one he has on says Atlantic Records suck anyway so it's kind of uh, bashing Atlantic Records uh, as he does this in concert which is a very funny idea um, but yeah uh, been uh, I said I really like this album really good definitely put this song on the album makes it even better I don't know if it goes much further up my list maybe um, definitely some songs on here you could have replaced it with uh, that would have been great um, just a couple other just minor things I read about um, <clears throat> the Yankee Vic thought about he was going to do a song off of um, Daniel Powder's uh, Bad Day, which was a you know, hit song at the time. It was going to be called You Had a Bad Date instead of, your, instead of um, Bad Day, it was You Had a Bad Date, which sounds like a funny song, could have been a funny song. And Powder, but Powder, he actually wrote the song, he was going to record it. He asked Powder for permission to do it. Powder said no, he didn't want him to do the song, so he didn't do it on, so he wasn't going to do it on the record. Then right before he was going to start recording, uh, Powder changed his mind and said, okay, you you can do that parody song. But Yankovic said, well, it's too late. I'm ready to record the album. I got the songs I want to record. So unfortunately, we never gotten that song. He's never put on another album so far. So that was an album song that we missed that could have been good. Who knows? Um, another song from T-Pain, which I'm not real familiar with T-Pain. He has a song called um, I'm in Love with a Stripper. And... Um, Weird Al was going to do a parody song called I'm in Love with the Skipper, um, talking about the Skipper on Gilligan's Island. Uh, and Team Payton gave him permission and everything, but he decided not to put the song on the album, I guess. Overall, he, he maybe didn't think it was a strong enough song, which, and we haven't gotten that song either, so that's another song that could have been on there but didn't get on there, which sounds like a funny idea. Um, two other funny ideas that Yankovic has, I don't know if this is, this is what I'm reading on the internet, so I don't know if it's 100% true. But it says that Yankovic kind of, um, I don't know if he wrote or recorded this music at all, but he's kind of talked about some ideas he had for song parodies. And uh, two I thought were pretty funny sounding. One was Holodeck Girl instead of Holoback Girl, Gwen Stefani's song, uh, Holodeck Girl, which I'm guessing is kind of referring to uh, like the holodeck on Star Trek. Um, and then the one I think is really funny is Harry Back, which is a parody of Sexy Back from Justin Timberlake. I can just imagine Harry back being a really funny song, but something he never has put out. Um, I'd say overall, like I said, very funny uh, album, uh, White and Nerdy. Um, Canadian idiot, not a huge fan, but I guess it's pretty well known on here. Um, I'll sue ya. Like I say, the thing about Weird Al Yankovic's albums, it usually has one or two really good songs on it, maybe three absolutely hilarious songs, really good parodies, maybe originals, um, but then most of the albums usually filler and aren't as funny or as interesting. This is why this album's on my list is because not only it has some great songs, some hit songs on here, but even the filler songs are pretty good and are very funny. Um, and I like, it's, he's one of those artists, of course, you want to listen to every lyric because, you know, you, you know, it's going to be funny. Um, I'll sue you is one of these filler songs that I think it's pretty funny about kind of par or kind of making fun of people that you know sue over little things in life and it kind of goes overboard on suing uh, very funny uh, virus alert is a decent song about you know uh, getting a computer virus and then it's making you do all these little, you know things that it's not going to be able to make you do uh, it's going to you know do all these it's going to give you a hickey it's going to do all these, you know, things, of course, they can't do, so that's the comedy of that one. Um, Close But No Cigar, actually a very funny song, uh, one of my favorites on here, uh, which is it's just a song about uh, dating a, a girl that's, like, perfect, she's smart, she's good-looking, but then she has one little issue, like, one ear is bigger than the, just a little bit bigger than the other ear, and so he's saying, you know, oh, you have all these good qualities, but you have this one little quality that I don't like. So it's close, but no cigar, you know, so he, he dumps the girl. And so it's kind of funny to make fun of, kind of make fun of himself as, you know, too high expectations. <laughs> he's never going to find the perfect person because he just, nobody's going to be perfect. And he's just finding these little things that, who cares, you know. 
It's a very funny song. Um, and then uh, Don't Download the Song, really, really good. One of my favorites on the album. Uh, it's kind of in the parody of a 80s, uh, you know, charity song. You know, get a bunch of artists together and, you know, try to raise money for something. Uh, but it's all about don downloading music, you know, because back in the day, there used to be a big deal, and like Napster and all these uh, downloading sites where you're downloading music, and musicians were very unhappy because, you know, they want you to pay for their music, not get it for free. And so it's kind of making fun of the artists a little bit, of, you know, being a little hypocritical of, you know, they're millionaires, and yet they get upset because you, you know, don't pay a dollar for a song or something. Uh, so very funny. The lyrics are very funny and very well done. It really sounds like a, a charity song from the 80s with a lot of different musicians. Uh, very well done uh, vocally and everything. Um, yeah, so very funny album. Uh, good parody songs. The funny thing is I didn't know these songs are parodies, like White Nerdy. Didn't know that was a parody song. Didn't know the original at all. Um, and then Confessions Part 3, Trapped in a drive through I had no idea those were parody songs. I just thought those were original ideas that he had, but they actually came from other songs I didn't know. So, I mean, overall, just great work and parodying and great original work. All works out for a really um, solid uh, album from number one to number 12. I said the only uh, song I don't care for is Weasel Stomping Day. Uh, Pancreas is not that good, but everything else, pretty solid. Uh, and if, if you like comedy, I guess I like comedy albums, so uh, it's definitely one of the best comedy albums I've heard. Um, so I go to number my top three here. Uh, number three, I'm gonna do Trapped in the Drive Through, uh, a parody song off of an R. Kelly song called Trapped in the Closet, Closet, which I'm not aware of. Um, it's a really long song; it's like an 11 minute song or something. And it's all just about a couple um, deciding to go out to eat and going out to the drive-thru because they didn't want to get dressed and go to a restaurant. So they just want to get, catch something in the car and, you know, eat it and take it home. And But it's a very dramatic, you know, it's something we do every day. That's what's funny about it is that it's, it's overly dramatic, very intense. The song is very intense. Everything is, you know, lots of tension. And, the, and it's just going to the drive-thru. But yet it's... Uh, it's a very dramatic event in their life, it feels like. Um, I love, like, one of my favorite parts of the song is they're going to go to the drive-thru and it says, you know, we're going to the drive-thru, we're going to the drive-thru, we're heading to the drive-thru, we're almost to the drive-thru, here's the drive-thru, did I mention the drive-thru? And so, it just says drive-thru like seven times in a row, and so it's just funny that he's like, did I mention the drive-thru? It's like, yeah, you've been saying it a, a whole bunch. Uh, like that's a very funny and had just how the intensity of his voice and that and then stuff like um, his wife uh, he says you know let's get two burgers and his wife said I want a chicken sandwich and, and he says what you always get a burger and she says oh I changed my mind and then he and then the song's like I you know I look up in the heavens and yell I don't know you anymore like it's that big of a deal but he acts like it's you know his wife is like making this big you know change in her life that surprises him uh, stuff like that. That's uh, it's a very funny song. It's very long, but well worth it. Um, a listen for sure. Uh, number two on my top three is Confessions Part Three, which is a parody of a song called Confessions Part Two by Usher, which I never heard of. Um, so this is Part Three. Usher did Part Two, and so the whole idea is uh, here's uh, another confessions to make, and of course these confessions that he's making are, you know not confessions you need to make they're very strange very funny confessions that you know it's and it really shows what a great comedy writer um weird al is and coming up with all these ideas of confessions to make that you don't need to make like my favorite is you know when we're kissing or something like that i i, I imagine i'm kissing a midget and he says i'm so sorry deborah i mean bridget because he like forgets his girlfriend's name is bridget not deborah but the idea that, you know, why would he confess that he thinks about kissing a midget? You know, you don't need to confess that. <laughs> and so that was funny uh, way of confessing that. Or sometimes I like to dress up like Shirley Temple and spank myself with a hockey stick. It's one of his confessions. It's like, why would you confess that? That's something nobody needs to know. And he doesn't, the girlfriend doesn't even know that. Anyways, but it's a funny idea. But it's a lot of funny ideas. And, and the vocal work is just amazing. 
uh, and he does so many different voice. Like I said, he does the leads, and then he does all these backing vocals that are singing different lyrics. So it was all these different, and they work well together. Um, just absolutely love that song. One of his best songs that I don't think are talked about as much. Um, it's Confessions Part Three, uh, and then number one, I've been talking about it the whole time. It's the biggest single of all time. White Nerdy. It's got to be White Nerdy. It's got to be one of my favorites. Maybe my favorite Weird Al song. Again, it just speaks to me a little bit as being a white person. And, uh, you know, growing up a little nerdy. I like sci-fi. I like fantasy. Uh, I love movies, of course. Um, I'm not quite as smart as far as math and science go. Uh, but I understood a lot of references that he makes in this song. And go, yeah, I understand all these references. And, and I kind of participate in some of them. Uh, but just absolutely hilarious. It's a rap song, which I'm not a rap fan, but uh, I like Weird Al when he raps. He's very funny when he's rapping. And uh, I didn't know it was a parody song either. I didn't know the original, but a uh, very well done uh, parody song. Um, yeah, just one some just really speaks to nerd culture and uh, what's it like to, you know, touches on a lot of all the nerdy things that people are into anyways uh yeah just absolutely hilarious very well done like i said i went to a weird al yankovic concert with my sister um older sister and uh i think her boyfriend at the time which is now her husband and um then his son was also with us the four of us went to a weird al concert uh at the cotillion in wichita kansas and um great concert um one of my favorite to go to uh, love to see him again. Um, but my sister and I were wearing uh, white and nerdy shirts. We had uh, these long sleeve shirts and it said white and nerdy on them. So I mean, we we loved white and nerdy. That was you know that was the big thing at the time. Yeah. So that's my top song, top three there. Uh, yeah. Can't say much. Um, I don't know if everybody. Weird Al Yankovic might not be for everybody, but. If you're like me and you grew up listening to him, I mean, this is uh, really good stuff. Highly recommend. So, Straight Out of Linwood is number 85. And so that's the last album we'll talk about here. And uh, I'll do some more uh, coming up this next week. And uh, enjoy re listening to all these albums and trying to analyze them and researching them. And enjoy talking about them with you guys. And just enjoy any comments you have about what you think about these two albums, what you think about Chicago, what you think about Weird Al Yankovic. Have you seen them in concert? What's your favorite songs? I love any comments anyway. So uh, thank you again, and I appreciate all your support.